this podcast is brought to you by Midwinter. These guys were a startup, an entrepreneurial startup some 10 years ago, way before it was even cool to be a tech startup, and have since then gone on to win every single award year after year after year when it comes to financial advice software. I use them, um, I know a lot of people that have, and if you haven't already jumped onto the new way of doing business, which is all cloud-based and API, so it all talks to each other, then go look at yourself in the mirror and sort yourself out and go get Midwinter. Got it. And go. Cool. Yeah. All right, so we'll start off. We've got uh, Nikhil Shrida. Uh, he was from Pro ProAdvisor. Uh, it uh, was a robo-advice business and they've shut down the doors. And now Nick's with uh, Macquarie as a BDM. Uh, so thanks for coming, Nick. No worries. Thanks very much for having me. No worries. Um, so we're going to talk about, we'd love to just to know, what was Pro ProAdvisor uh, and what did you guys do? Just to start off, give us a bit of background. Sure. So, so the story started um, um, back in 2013. So I incorporated the company when I was 22. I just left university. Um, and it was pretty much um, trying to sort of bring the concept of carsales.com or domain.com.au to the financial planning industry. And back then, there wasn't any website like that. So it started off as that, spent about six months building out the platform, hiring developers and getting that sort of um, matchmaking marketplace up and going. And um, sort of once 2014 came around, the tech was ready and it was just sort of um, getting out in the financial planner community to get advisors signing up and also to get clients using the platform. So it started off as a bit of a um, as a bit of a lead generation marketplace, which we did quite well numbers wise. We did about five hundred leads a year of various quality, um, but we found that some not every single one of those leads were ready to you know pay for financial advice or sort of um, progress with a financial advisor. And we were sort of looking for a way to incubate those prospects till they were ready to meet with a financial planner because that was our business model, which was also the moment at which we got paid as well. So it was so, so, so that's sort of when um, the robo advice hype sort of started coming in. That was sort of you know to the to the later half of last year, and we decided that we could build it ourselves. So me and Truman, my co-founder, who's Who's the, who's the software engineer? Um, we spent about three months building out the tech, building out the robo advice technology um, in the later half of the year, and we launched in January this year, pretty much on our last legs as a way to see what we could potentially do if this was the catalyst that would give us the, the, the success that we needed. But we ran out of money, and we just wanted to take it as a bit of learning and. Um, take things forward from there. So we started off as a as a lead gen marketplace, and then ended off as a robo advice platform. Yeah, right. Um, and so, like, as an ex fintech founder, when it was uh, really cool to be in fintech, I mean, it still is. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are the kind of pitfalls uh, that advice businesses, uh, so advisors, need to consider when uh, implementing new technologies? Yeah, well, well, you could sort of um, put put a comparison that Pro Advisor itself was an advice business, except that we didn't provide the advice, but we still went out there try to engage with clients both online and offline, and um, and you know wanted them to use the platform to find an advisor. So from sort of a marketing perspective, you know, um, when impl- when when implementing new technologies, I think I think it is you know really important to understand what your target market is because you know not everyone is online or not everyone requires the technology required to um, um, automate the marketing and then the other thing is you know sort of figuring out what sort of business you you want to build like there's nothing wrong in having a super you know um, um, tech focused business and there's absolutely nothing wrong in having a traditional business where you may have you know may, may be a little bit paper heavy but that's just sort of how you want to run your business. So it's sort of marrying up the both and just finding technology that fits in between both of those, um, of those sort of um, criteria that, that, that you have. And there's heaps of technology out there. It's just a matter of finding the right one and customizing it for it, for it to work for you. Mm. 
I guess because we had Ian Dunbar on last fortnight and yeah. talk about how do you, how do we think about um, bringing in different technologies. I guess from your point of view, if we um, how do how do we because there's a fear from advisors that we jump into a technology and then they may fall over because they don't get an, the next round of funding. Um, so yeah. how do we as advisors evaluate that? Is there any way we can do that? Well. Well, in, in, in the sense that you're asking about sort of how you'd implement a new feature and whether or not it works or in terms of um, building a proprietary technology piece for your business that's not out there. It's, you know, I'm, I'm more going down like the features. Like if we plug in yeah. an integral bit of technology, but then that technology provider might not be around. Yeah, got it, got it. Well, 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 from, well from, from that perspective, you know, a lot of the technologies that we used weren't focused on the financial planning space because we focused on the marketing and the business automation side of things. And there's heaps of technologies in the States and, 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 and it's just generic to small business. So from those providers not, no, no longer being around a few years from now, that's probably not a risk to worry about. But also you'll find that these technologies, there's plenty of them to choose from. It's just that each one has a little niche or, or a little feature that is more useful to you than the other one. So it's just a bit of compromising here and there. But from, 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 but from, an, from an advisor's perspective, there's lots of choice out there and it just requires you know, a weekend to just sit down and map it all out and see how you want to implement it. Yeah, great. So, last question about Pro Advisor and, and the history of it. Uh, yeah. Knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the sort of on a on a personal level is um, is that I incorporated the company when I was twenty one. So a lot of ego and and it sort of gets to your head when you're quite young and you know on paper, yes, you're you're a founder of a company and sort of that. You know, I, I would say in the early start of my career that got to my head a bit too quickly and you could say that didn't really you know work out well for the company or the customers but um after pro advice i started reading a book called um zero to one it was written by zero by, by peter teal the first um investor in facebook and um he's a vc now and he pretty much talks about the seven questions he uses to um evaluate a company so um, you know, if I had to go back and redo Pro Advisor, I would always do every action according to these seven questions. And I have them, have them in front of me, but it's worthwhile having a read of this book. But the seven questions that are is the first one is, can you create a breakthrough solution? The question um, number two is, is the market ready for your solution? Um, third one is, can, you, um, can your solution dominate a niche? Um, do you have the right team? Can you distribute your solution better than anyone else? And will your solution stand the test of time 10 years from now? And the final one is, is your solution built on a secret? So when we evaluated this, we actually spent, you know, a couple of weeks um, after the shutting down Pro Advisor, me and Schumann, um, just going through these seven questions personally. And we only answered three of those seven. So um, it sort of makes sense why we didn't get Pro Advisor off the ground. Um, so yeah, so that's the one thing I would do differently. Yeah, great. So what, what was that book again? Zero? Yes, it is. So the book is called Zero to One and it's written by Peter Thiel. Yeah, no, great. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I'm still in that, uh, the, the ego phase. So maybe, maybe I'll um, get over that soon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So yeah, yeah Benny, Benny's put his hand up as well. Um, so all right, now moving away from Pro Advisor, because one thing that you guys did really well is um, automating your marketing, uh, and you said you get yeah. five hundred leads per year, and uh, and there was a team of just the two of you. That's correct. Yeah, it's correct. Right. Yeah, so I mean that's that's really impressive, and and as any advice business, um, bringing clients in the door or bringing leads in the door is is really important. So. Um, what did you, what are the things that you learned about automating your kind of lead gen? Yeah, sure. So, so you could say out of those seven startup questions, we answered the, the distribution question very well. So, um, because it was just the two of us, we didn't have the resources, you know, to have a sales team or even a marketing manager. So in terms of automating the lead, the, the lead, gen, we wanted to just get everything um, scaled up as quickly as possible with, 
with actually little financial resources as well. So in terms of automating the lead gen and marketing, we actually engage with, um, with a VA company in the Philippines to do a lot of, um, you could say, um, the, the, the low touch, not so personalized work. And that's sort of, you know, putting stuff onto the website, just organizing, you know, um, posts and stuff like that on social media. But then off the back of that, we read, um, we, 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 we read into um, 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 this really um, good blog that we like a lot. It's called um, um, Quick Sprout, which is um, written by Neil, by Neil Patel. And he's, and he's one of, you could say, the thought, the thought leaders in the internet marketing space. And it pretty, pretty much covers off on everything from um, um, Google AdWords to SEO to social media advertising. And he has lots of great content. And off the back of that, we developed a 42 touch point marketing funnel, which we implemented into ProAdvisor. And that pretty much would, um, you know, it, it had a whole bunch of eBooks in there, a whole bunch of um, lead, 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 lead magnets, and also um, um, advertising off Facebook and Google. And, you could, and it was pretty much, um, you know, we had constructed in such a way that the client would bounce around receiving information or be a part of this lead funnel until they were ready to see an advisor, which was in um, in our view when we got paid. So that was our conversion. But as a financial advisor, you would have a 42 point you know um, 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 marketing funnel before that lead even comes in to see you, and then you'd have a, you know a longer nurturing campaign once they're already on the books because that first meeting may not lead to a client signing up immediately. Yeah, wow. A 42-point um, touch yeah. funnel. Yeah, for me, I'm, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very unsophisticated when, when comparing to pro <laughs> advisor. Uh, mine is they give me a call and I go from there. Um, yeah. So, guys, for everyone who's watching, um, Nick's had heaps of experience about the marketing and automating marketing with 500 leads. So, feel free to ask as many questions, and we'll get to it towards uh, the end of the interview. So, kind of ask away, uh, and they won't, the questions won't be missed. So, my next question: um, yeah. I'm I'm an advisor. I run my own business. I would love to know kind of five things because I. Yeah. For me, it's difficult to build out a 42 touch point thing uh, while I'm still servicing clients um, and it's kind of that goal that may be a bit unrealistic. But what are like five things that um, we should do, you know, today or this week that, that can help us? Correct. Craig. Well, I, th I think the first thing is to figure out your ideal target market and where they spend most of their time. So, so when it comes down to an, an ideal target market, it's, it's as hyper-specialised as possible and then sort of figuring out you know where they spend their time and if it is on the internet and if it is you know um, 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 in social media it's quite possible that you know automated marketing will provide some ROI if your clients are not going to be online you know um, um, automated marketing may not work as well because it because it is primarily something that leverages um, um, in social media and Google and, um, and sort of emails and that sort of thing. So that's probably the first step. Um, the second step is, is to map out your entire customer journey. So I actually learnt, learnt this when I was with the Entourage. I'm not sure if you, if you guys have heard of um, Jack, Delo Jack Delosa and the Entourage, but essentially um, I, I did that for a year and um, one of the talks was on, um, was on marketing and it was pretty much mapping out the entire customer journey and it starts at the moment, you know, let's say in financial planning, like a year before um, they actually come in to meet you, the, the very first moment they even think about buying a house or, you know, consolidating super or, 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 or whatever that is. It's mapping out from that moment all the way to the point that they sign up to you and, you know, getting into as much detail as you can. And if you can map all of that out, you can start figuring out parts of that process that you could automate and you know a very simple one would be you know to post something on social media and and, and that's probably you know a, a, a very you know initial um, 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 part of the customer journey when they would get to know about you and financial planning mm -hmm. and then once you do map out our customer journey the third point would be to start small like like just start automating a really simple really quick end um, you know 
um, not so um, um, risky thing to automate. Like if something does go wrong, it's not that big a deal. And, you know, for example, that might be curate a, a post for Instagram every day or, or, or it might be to just create and create an ebook and market it on, on your, on your, on your email list. So, so, so start small and just build off the top of that. So pretty much the fourth thing that the fourth thing that you would do is from that first start task, start um, going back to your customer journey and start building out automations along the way. And what you'll notice is that you know, there's heaps of apps out there that can do it for you. So you might have an app like Schedulegram, which will do all your, all your um, Instagram posts, you know, one month in advance and it just ticks along on its own. Or you might have an app like Lead Pages or, or Unbounce, which would do your lead capture on your own website. So you can start, you know, adding in all those um, components. And then um, the, fifth, the fifth one is pretty much bring, bringing all those components together, which is, um, in, which is integrating it all together and having it go into your CRM or your database so you can have a bit of a history of how that client has interacted with you from the very first moment, which is when they may have just visited your website. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's great. Um, so just for everyone who's watching, I'm, I'm hearing rumours that uh, we're having some technical issues. Um, right. People are having issues chatting. I know Ben Nash can't chat. And, um, so if you want to ask questions, um, you can use Twitter. Uh, tweet at, <laughs> at Phil J. Tomo, uh, your questions, uh, or at Ben Nash. I don't know what his handle is. Just, just for everyone watching as well, if you do have questions, if you change, I know we normally say um, to put your chat to everyone, but if your chat isn't working, if you just change it to all panellists instead of everyone, if you do have a question, if you just type it in there, then that, that seems to be working for us as well. I think Zoom's a bit buggy this morning. Sorry, guys. Yeah, we're, we're having some issues. I, I'm seeing some chat come through now, but um, j just find a way. Give me a phone call. You can ask your questions that way. We'll, we'll work it out. Let's go old school. <laughs> so I mean that's that's awesome. I kind of e even just the kind of the, the five things that you you talked about um, is still you know a, a lot for um, people to you know to think about um, when setting up this automated marketing. Uh, and I've I've slowly started to touch on it in my business. But uh, what are the kind of tools and technologies? Because you said let's integrate it. Let's have a lead capture. So what are these kind of yeah. tools? That you you use a pro advisor that um, advisors can use. Correct, correct. So so um, there's probably you know we actually use maybe twelve to thirteen um, apps that did everything in the back end and sort of um, at the end of this I'll sort of send around that, so that I've made a bit of an an an, um, an infographic for you all. But essentially the tools come on under four categories and it's sort of about um, you know where do you first nurture them. And, um, you know, that's your social media and that's your Google and that's your SEO. But then it's then then they, you know, go down into, um, you know, uh, um, where, you know, how do you capture that online traffic into a name and a number? And there's quite a, quite a few tools there which we use. And that was Unbounce and Lead Pages. So they did um, a lot of um, landing, la la a lot of landing page um, software from there. And then off the back of that, it just goes straight into a, um, a, um, an email marketing software. So we used um, Active Campaign. So I'm not sure if you guys are aware of Infusionsoft, um, but that's probably um, um, you know, the most complex and probably of, of a fairly close enterprise level software out there, but it's quite expensive. Um, Active Campaign does the same thing and it's like nine US dollars a month and it scales up depending on the amount of users you have. So you can actually start running your, you know, your funnel off the back of Active Campaign, and it's really cheap. And the good thing about Active Campaign is that it actually sends it to your CRM as well. So that was one um, software that we were quite, um, um, you know, um, happy to use all the way. And and then and then once that's all finished, I guess you know, you know, your CRM, but. It's sort of hard to say in terms of what technologies we'd recommend for an advisor. I guess it really comes down to, you know, what purpose you want from that because there's literally hundreds of 
software for each category. Like, you know, just for, just for email marketing, there's Salesforce, there's MailChimp, there's um, Active Campaign. They all do a great job, but one has a little edge over the other. So it really depends how an advisor wants their business to be run. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. I um, I used Infusion. Well, I paid for Infusionsoft for a good four yeah. or five months and never used it. Uh, yeah. And then just uh, <laughs> grab it. And I've moved to Active Campaign, and I'm just starting yeah. to use it. So yeah. I've got to be really cool. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, th- this is fantastic. The thing I'll I'll hand it over to Ben to kind of uh, ask some more questions that he's gotten out of it. But the things yeah. that I've gotten out of this conversation so far is get rid of the ego. Uh, and maybe look at using a, a VA uh, um, amongst the kind of 20 other dot points that I've written down to, to implement into my business. So handing over to you, Ben, with some more questions. Cool. All right. Cheers, Nick. Thanks for, for sharing that. I think um, interesting and, you know, obviously something that's, uh, I think, important for all advisors in nurturing their, their leads through, yeah. uh, through the, the journey up to the point that they're ready. Um, I'm keen, though, to chat a little bit more, given your, your background in, in the robo-advice side of things. I know that's something that's pretty topical uh, at the moment. So um, I'm just interested, as someone that's been right there sort of inside it, what do you see as the future for robo-advice? Yeah, so so when we started, it was in October, November, about this time last year when, you know, the hype was big, you know. Um, um, the bigger firms had just raised money, um, you know, Future Advisor was, you know, probably two or three months after selling to BlackRock for millions of dollars. Um, the robo advisors in the country had just started raising money. So, so it was, it was, it was fairly, you know, we, we got in at the bit of the hype. Mm. And, and to be honest, from our experience, from being in there and sort of trying to get clients on the books, it's really expensive. Like, like because we were, we, we were doing lead, lead, lead generation, you know, we were able to get leads, you know, um, lead, leads in for about a hundred, a hundred and fifty dollars. Um, and that was regardless of whether they were a seven million dollar account that needed advice or they were just a mum and dad just looking to refinance the mortgage. So, 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 so that was the sort of average value to get a name, email and a phone number and a committed client. That was the, the dollar value to get someone in and for robo advice. You know, in hindsight, we probably should have just referred back to these numbers and probably said, you know, let's not bother about it. But it's just very expensive, you know, um, to get someone in where you know, they might have a twenty thousand dollar portfolio and they're just sitting in there, kicking over with some ETFs. You're not going to make a lot of money off them. Um, you probably run at a loss. And and from from an from an advisor's perspective, it's probably you know, better to refer them to a robo advisor and have that thought leadership than having to build it yourself or run that model yourself because it's going to be yeah. quite expensive to still service it. But also this is probably something that, you know, a lot of the viewers or, um, or you know, the, the, the general industry may not believe in or sort of... Um, so me and Schumann's experience with robo advice is that, you know, it was all about trying to get the 80 percent of Australian citizens or um, you know um, 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 to get financial advice but from our experience we actually think maybe the 80 percent don't need structured financial advice you know maybe it's best for them not to see an advisor for very basic things and maybe it's just best for them to just go and read a book or just do self-education because that's probably going to be better for them in the long run. So I think robo advice, you know, um, the hypothesis is that the 80% need advice and or look, we're going to build technology that can do it at a lower cost. But um, maybe the secret is that the 80% just don't need it. Yeah. And yeah. That's just interesting. Uh, yeah. I, I think it is so definitely I think you're right to, to a degree that there's a bunch of people in that space that could benefit from something in a in a low touch model um, yeah. so yeah I think that's that's a great question to ask um, with the, just going back to your point you said so it's like a hundred to 150 dollars to um, get a get a lead in the door do you have any stats on what the conversion was off the back of that yeah, so so because we were handing them out to our advisors and we were sort of tracking to see, you know, um, um, how long it took and when those clients converted, we, we were probably seeing about 
one in 20, you know, one in 15 actually converting into customers within a three month period. And wow. that's sort of the reason why, even though we were quite good at getting leads through online, why we didn't sort of, you know, pursue that even further. Cause just the conversion rates weren't great. But that being said, these clients were still interested and, you know, from my brief experience working at Macquarie, you know, you know, there's some advisors here that are working on clients for, you know, two, three years at a time, and then they sign up. So it's just, you know, we are in, in an industry that is, um, you know, it's, it's a long sales cycle and you just have to be prepared to keep nurturing them. So from, from a, you know, running a lead generation marketing company, it's all about cash flow as well. So we just can't, we just couldn't wait beyond three months to wait for a, a lead to convert. So that's yeah. sort of the convenience outlet, but then who knows, you know, if it, as, as, as you would all know, it just takes a trigger six months from now or three months from now for that same yeah. client to go, to go, oh, you know what, I need to have a chat to Ben again. I need to have a chat to Phil again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's something that I commonly see in, in my business where you'll chat to somebody and they won't be ready and then, they come back at some point it's like you say some trigger or something's happened and um they're there so but that, i think that's quite interesting to see you know 100 150 dollars a person 15 to 20 um leads to to convert within three months so that means that we're looking at you know a lead cost of you know somewhere between 1500 and you know potentially over three thousand dollars um right. and then you've got the cost to cost to serve so um so that's interesting what do you think about the uh, the idea of plugging it, you know, for say, imagine for myself, I've got my high touch model that I work through with clients, but um, do you think it's a viable option if I, cause I come across people where they maybe they could benefit, like you say, some of those 80% that they um, yeah. just simple advice or super or portfolio management. Do you think that's viable? Correct. Correct. Well, well I, I guess it also comes down to um, what you would consider to be low touch and robo advice. So if it was robo advice purely around portfolio management, you know, that's no different than saying to that client, you know, let's set you up on an SMA and let that tick over and that rebalances itself. But if it's more about the education piece, there's probably something that you can do there and have a white labeled portal on your website with a few calculators and, and, and a few game, gamified sort of um, widgets here and there. But if it's robo advice in the investment space, I now no longer think it is viable because there's a lot of low cost platforms out there where you can go in with five grand or 10 grand. And sure, the, the initial setup will, 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 will require an advisor to create an SOA or an ROA. But once yeah. the client in there, it ticks over just like any other robo advice platform. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And do you think though, for things like say a, an ins maybe simple insurance advice or something that it's that that might become a solution that you know be becomes more popular over time or something? Yeah. Yeah. Like like to be honest, I've never worked in the insurance space, um, so I, I can't really comment on it much. But um, you know. I've been doing a few SOAs here at Macquarie Insurance and it is very complicated. And, you know, in terms of automating that or scaling that out, there are a few risks involved because everyone holds insurance in super and, you know, that's not a very transparent part of the industry to yeah. get data on what exactly is sort of going on. So from that perspective, you know, you could, you could see that high barrier to entry as a huge opportunity or, you could see it the other way as well, but but there is potential for something to come in there. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Watch this space, I suppose. Um, and, and what do you think about the the? Because I know that, like you say, like uh, around the middle of last year, when all of this robo advice was was sort of blowing up all over in the states and um, yeah. and really taking off, and then there was a bit of a correction in markets, and we saw a lot of people that had, that. Uh, basically just withdrew funds and, and suffered, you know, substandard investment outcomes as a result. Do you think that you know, when when someone's working only with a robo-advisor, be that a low-touch sort of um, yeah. type option or, uh, or similar, that 
you know, that that can lead to or would, would typically lead to um, worse outcomes in those sorts of conditions within markets and, and at those big events for, for the people using the advice. Hello, Nick. He's investing. He's thinking. Like, sorry, sorry, we just we just lost you for a second there. Oh, okay, yeah, there we go. I mean, is, is it all is it all yep. good now? Yeah. Yes, I, I guess it also comes down to sort of you know the type of client that you have on the books as a robo advised investment client. Um, um, and 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 from and, and from that perspective, you know, sure, a client with more capital in there will be more susceptible to, you know, bigger, bigger movements and may require an advisor. But then, you know, your lower balance clients, you know, below $10,000 is what I'm sort of considering here that would be using robo advice. You know, those, those market corrections, sure, they may want to speak to an advisor, but even at that level, it might be best for them to just, you know, learn about it on their own. Because I think, you know, the cost that, you know, like, 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 for example, when I was younger, I, I learned the stock markets by losing money and I probably wouldn't have done it any, any other way. Cause you know, it's better than going to uni and doing theory on the markets. But when you lose a couple of thousand dollars, it's, you know, you actually understand why it happened. So in a way when markets correct themselves, you know, the younger generation or the low or the low balance account holders should probably see that as learning. But for the bigger accounts, I think personal capital in the States and, you know, even Vanguard is doing it quite well in the sense that you do get the opportunity to speak to an advisor once or twice a year to discuss your portfolio. And okay. that's probably a better way to go around it. But that being said, um, I still think, you know, um, uh, the experiment is still yet to be, un, um, you know, answered and that's, will clients convert from robo to full advised clients in the future? Mm. Interesting. So, so many uh, sort of watch this space type of questions, right? Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Well, that's awesome. And it's great to get that insight just in terms of your, your views, having been so, so close to, to robo. Um, I'm sure we could chat about this all day, but um, I'm keen to get to some of these questions from sure. the guys watching in. If, if anyone else is, is watching in, if, you, if you've got questions, it seems like the chat's sort of working. If yours isn't, you can just type to all panellists and it should come through to us. Um, first question we've got from Jenny Pierce. She, she was asking, did you have a, um, like a board of advice or um, a circle of trusted advisors that were helping you through the process when you were setting up your business and getting started? No, no. So, so when I first started, um, I really had no idea what I was doing. Um, you know, entity was set up, website was set up, and it was pretty much off the back of that and just trying to figure it out on my own. And that's probably the other thing that I would have done differently is actually, you know, um, have a structured process with mentors out there to catch up at least once a month or, you know, a couple of times, a couple of times a quarter to just bounce off ideas in a structured manner. Like, like we did, like we did reach out to, you know, you could say personal mentors and colleagues in the industry here and there, but it wasn't in a structured manner and such as a board of advisors or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. And that's probably, you could say, yeah, like no one's there to guide, to guide you to do it correctly. Yeah, I think that that stuff definitely helps, and you know, even when you know you're involved in coaching programs and those sorts of things, I know yeah. that having you know, a mentor is something that's given me heaps of benefit when uh, launching my business. And then, and actually, that's probably the reason why I joined up to the entourage sort of in that first year of business was I because I I knew that I didn't know what to do, but um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's something as advisors that we can probably do a bit better that we we probably don't do as well as we could do. So the next audience question is from Mark Rottenstein. He said, "Where can I find a consultant to help set all of this up and making sure that it's cheap?" <laughs> um, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so actually, um, since we um, stopped um, pro advising about. Um, you know, May, you know, April, May this year, both me and Schumann have been getting requests from sort of people in our network to do stuff like this. So um, we're in the process of launching our own little sort of consulting company on the side where we'll just do, you know, marketing automation. So it's called amoebalabs.com.au. 
it's still being built, still being sort of organized, but there's some information on there. And yeah, we're more than happy to have a chat. How do we spell that? Yeah, so let me put it in here. Yeah. There we go. So um, it's 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 all awesome. it's all in, uh, it's yeah. So so you know we're so so Schumann's a software developer. So he does a lot of the um, sort of the coding and stuff, and I sort of help with um, the marketing funnels and sort of getting all the touch points ready. Great. Cool. Um, got a question from Clayton Daniel here. Uh, he's just asking about you mentioned before about the. Um, the program and you're using it to track the the entire sort of journey of the people that come through your marketing funnel. Was that through Active Campaign or was it another program that you used? Yeah, sure. So 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 because Active Campaign was only once they had provided um, um, the name and number and a, and, a, and an email address, we actually um, you know you could say use two programs to to to, to track the customer journey and one was off traffic off the website so that was google analytics to pretty much see um, 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 the process flow of how a particular user went through the website and and i can't i can't remember what it was called but in google analytics there's a section and it pretty much shows page by page and how a particular user went through the website and when they end up on the landing page that becomes a name email and phone number you can somewhat work backwards to see what that user did so that was how we tracked, um, you could say, unidentified users. But once they, you know, provided name, email, and phone number, um, Active Campaign would send that to our CRM, and off the back of that, every email and every touch point would also be tagged into that CRM. So we would just see how many emails they received, did they open it? But that was not on Active Campaign. That would send the the, the information to another software that we you, we called, which was Insightly. Which is just a CRM. Okay. Yeah, great. So Ian Dunbar's tuned in and he's asked the question: What do you think will be the winner of in the robot robo advice space in Australia? Let's I, say. Yeah, yeah. I actually think like I because technology is so easy to make now. It you know it's not very hard to get very smart people in a room. And to build it out, and it's not, and it's not as expensive as it was ten to fifteen years ago. I actually think right now in Australia, because we followed um, the USA in robo advice, the people that will will win in robo advice are the banks. They can, you know, they can create really good technology. They have lots of smart people in there, and they already have the infrastructure, and they're willing to make a loss for two or three years to play the long term game, and. And from a robo advisor in this country trying to take off, you know, they're going to have to raise capital and find someone to, you know, you know, to, 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 um, you know, you know, um, what do you call it? Fund those losses. And I just don't think there's a market for that anymore in, 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 um, in the investment space. I don't think many people are willing to take that risk. There's like 15 robo advisors already in the country and I'm not sure how they're all doing, but we didn't do very well. So I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think the banks are going to kill it and it's just going to be another distribution model for them because they can charge yeah. you know, a few bips extra right. on their funds and the consumers aren't really going to be that switched on to know that. Uh, that's my right. best feeling. Yeah, same here. <laughs> Uh, just got another question from Naomi and um, she's asking about robo or digital advice. Um, whether, and I think I'm reading this question correctly in that whether it's a, a good way of, in, you think it's a good way of engaging um, consumers or that 80% directly with their finances or more as an engagement tool that will then lead them into, um, into getting, going down the path of getting a formal advice type relationship. Yeah, correct. I actually think the digital process will be um, will, will be the nurturing component and sort of the engagement component and also the back office component. I, um, from a financial planner's perspective, you know, to you know your you know your most value is in, is is you know being in front of those clients and and having that high touch relationship. You know, that digital aspect should be all about the back office and all about the engagement process until that client's ready to have a meeting with you. 
Okay, so so more on the yeah the, the lead manager side. Yeah, sure. yeah. Now that that's fantastic, Nikhil. Uh, I know I've uh, written down plenty of notes, uh, and just for everyone watching, um, Nick's kind of prepared. Uh, helped us with the. Correct me if I'm wrong. The forty-two point. Yeah. So 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 I've so before we built out um, built out our marketing funnel, I've got a PDF off it somewhere on my laptop. So I'm more than happy to send that around. So if you guys want to give a you know have a crack at it, you know go for it, or just send me an inquiry and I'll I'll see if I can help you out there as well. Yeah, I mean that's fantastic. We'll make sure you're on the XY Advisor mailing list because we'll send that out next week in our email. We'll we'll send out uh, the guide that Nick's kind of helped prepare for us. So uh, it's kind of a step by step guide that you guys can um, start going ahead and and automating your marketing and and taking these little tips, um, but actually getting some practical help. Um, you know, from from the PDF that Nick's gonna prepare for us uh, so that's fantastic thank you very much for that nick that's really generous no of you worries. no worries uh and just want to we're, we're finishing up but just want to say we've had some technical issues but guess what that's life we we go through issues and uh we kind of roll with the punches uh so thank you everyone for joining us uh and in next fortnight's time we've got uh vanessa stoikov from No More Practice, talking to us about um, you know how she's engaging uh, consumers in financial advice and and bringing financial advice into the mainstream because uh, they're doing um, amazing stuff at Evolution Media. Uh, so we're going to interview her and talk to her about how she's how she's doing all that. So thank you everyone for coming today, uh, and thank you Ben and thank you Nick. Sweet, no, thanks Cheers, everyone. Nicole. Awesome. All right. See you guys. Have a fantastic fortnight. And we'll see you in a fortnight's time. Yes, Wait. See you soon. Bye. See you guys.